Yeah, you might, you might have something. A lot of work to make that real, though. A lot of work. All right, so question for you. Is he lying? Is he lying about having the idea? Or is he living in his own reality distortion field? You know, that that term comes up with people like Steve Jobs. And I think, honestly, like the great, great entrepreneurs, they're a little imbalanced, frankly. So the first deal that I did with my partner when we started University Growth Fund was in Lyft. And so I was really excited when HBO launched this show, this series called Super Pumped, the story of Uber. And actually, I guess it's the battle for Uber. Anyways, so I thought it'd be really fun to go and do react videos of this show, where I talk about some of the things that happened in real time, some of the ways that the, they portray things and give my my perspective and hopefully like fill you in on like some of the things that are happening and cue you in on, on some of the inside jokes that might be happening. All right, let's get started. This could be the one, Bill. Could be. Leaves a lot of room for the other side of that wager belt. Is that where you land, Fenton? Just a little less bullish than he is. We're talking about committing millions of dollars and our reputational capital on this guy. To his product. And it is a great product. Yeah, Uber Cab is solid. Boy, the tech could really be something. And we like the space, but why not Cabulous or Taxi Magic? How do we know this Kalanick guy is the chosen one? So we've got point. What's counterpoint? He's the counterpoint. I made the original point. Look, Bill, something is going to pop in this space. This guy's reputation. You know how it goes with me. Travis and I start completing each other's sentences. Well, look, a unicorn will take flight in this sector. Someone will make a hundred x return on their investment. But is this Travis guy the kind of person who can ride one? I'll just be like one of those sheriffs in the westerns. Stand back six paces and stare him right in the eyes. And shoot him? <laughs> you know, at Benchmark Capital, we don't shoot founders. We leave that to Sequoia. Let's introduce the players here. So that is Bill Gurley, and he's with two of his other partners at Benchmark. And if you don't know who Bill Gurley is, he is one of the most storied venture capitalists in Silicon Valley. He's no longer actually an active venture investor, although he does opine on the space on occasion. Uh, on his blog. But just to give you a perspective, at this point, Bill Gurley is building a name for himself as the investor for marketplaces. He has backed companies like OpenTable and Grubhub and Zillow and DogVK and Odesk and a bunch of others. So he is kind of like the guy for marketplaces. Today, marketplaces seem kind of obvious and even passe, right? Like, you know, Uber is big, established, whatever. But back when this, when they first got funding and, and back when Bill Gurley was looking at this deal, marketplaces were new and fresh and this, this, this new idea that had just come about largely because of our mobile devices. I mean, think about Uber. Like Uber does not exist without your smartphone. Not just a phone, it can't just work on any phone. It's gotta work on a smartphone. And so really the advent of the Apple iPhone was really what kicked off a whole bunch of these marketplaces. Uber and Lyft and Airbnb, and to a certain extent, like Zillow is another type of marketplace, right? And OpenTable. And so he is kind of the guy. And then let's talk about Benchmark. So Benchmark was started in the 90s. It was, it was interesting because it was a bunch of these kind of junior partners at different funds that spun out and launched their own fund together. And they made a ton of waves because one, they called it Benchmark, which is like, fairly like egotistical thing to name your firm if you think about it like we are the standard by which all others are going to be measured but their first fund is arguably the benchmark it is the top performing fund of its size of pretty much all time so that fund was an early investor in ebay and they ended up returning something crazy like they invested 6.7 million dollars into ebay and returned in two years they returned $7.8 billion back to investors. And then their carry check on that was well over a billion dollars on top of that. So effectively, all the partners at Benchmark in that very first fund 
uh, that they raised ended up being worth hundreds of millions of dollars based on that one and $6.7 million investment in eBay. And that's really how Benchmark got its start and built a name for itself as, on that first fund. Benchmark also has this like really interesting strategy where they believe that venture capital doesn't scale and that everybody, every partner should be treated equally. And so when they bring on a new partner and somebody else leaves, they leave everything. They're in, they're out of the business completely. And the new partner gets treated as though they were the same as everybody else in the firm in terms of economics and, and pay and so forth. And so what that also has engendered, which is what he mentions here, is that when Bill invests in the company, you don't just get Bill, you get the entire team at Benchmark because they're all working together. They're all compensated equally. And so they all have a vested interest in making sure that they're companies are successful. And as part of that, they are very focused on building a reputation of being very founder friendly and using that as a way to get access to some of these best deals. And unlike other firms, they don't just fire entrepreneurs when things are inconvenient or when they feel like they need to upgrade to a better CEO, which is a two double-edged sword because on the one hand, that's great, like you're founder friendly, but it also means that you got to be careful who you back and that they can make it, they can take it all the way, which is why he's having this conversation with his colleagues. They know that something is going to blow up here. Something is going to be successful. If it's not Uber, it's somebody else. And they're trying to decide, is he the guy, is Kalanick the guy that can take it all the way? Let's see what they end up deciding. Here he is. Mr. Gurley. Just Bill. Everybody's got the numbers on the company, so I'm not going to grill you on that. <laughs> well, that's studying for nothing. But I do want to understand how it is that you see yourself growing into the role of CEO. Not every founder can. First day out of high school, LeBron James had a meeting at Reebok. He took the bus there, it's all he could afford. And he was sitting at the longest conference table in the world with the CEO. And they're talking, and LeBron notices, oh, the CEO's starting to write something. And then the CEO gets up, and he walks the length of this whole table, and he drops a check in front of him for $10 million. Now, it's only the two of them in there, and, uh, and LeBron's only 18. And the way he tells it, he almost took the check, right? He almost started crying, because everything he ever worked for in his life just suddenly made manifest in front of him. But he didn't. He stood up and he walked out. Strong move. Yeah, the man understood his value. Right? And eventually, he signed for much more with the place he wanted to be, Nike. But first, he had to ride the bus a few more times to get to the Bentleys and the PJs. But you're not walking out. No. Because you're not just some VC. You're Nike. See, what he does there, it's really interesting. So Bill Gurley's like, tell me why you are the guy, right? Just that whole conversation I had. And he's basically saying two things. He's saying, one, he's like, look, I've eaten a ton of crow over the years and two, like I'm ready to make this thing big and I want to do it with you. But he doesn't actually answer his question, which is, you know, kind of interesting. And I know it. You know, maybe we don't sell each other tonight. Just, let's just talk a bit. Oh, if I were selling you, you'd already have your wallet out. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm here in the spirit of connection and in that spirit, I'll tell you, I believe I have underachieved in my potential as a leader. But if I had a mentor like you, there is no limit to where this thing could go. How do you think your drivers would describe their relationship with the company? There, we've done it right. Our drivers? Your army. That's what I was gonna say. Our army, yeah, and I believe an army with a full belly. It's an army that can win, yes. Yes, sir. And that part, it's not just self-serving either. It's a big part of the whole motivation for me. I really believe this service can be a true value, can be so good for so many people, so many groups of people. Ever since the very beginning, from the first time I had the idea. I love like the foreshadowing here because he's asking about the drivers. And when we made our investment in Lyft, this is like a whole other like side tangent. And, and frankly, I should do a video on it. But like to me, Uber never really cared about their drivers. 
Lyft, and that really opened up the opportunity for Lyft to even exist because they were able to go full-fledged into treating the drivers with a lot more respect than than Uber ever gave them. And it, so it's interesting how the producers uh, and director like foreshadow that as being a major like issue uh, that Uber has to contend with even from the very beginning with Bill's comment. Well, from, um, from when Garrett Camp and I had the idea. I bet. We were in Paris, the top of the Eiffel Tower. And I remember it just came to me in a burst. I saw a way to upend the wage slavery of the taxi business, you know, to democratize the entire industry for the good of those hardworking drivers, as well as for the passengers. I saw it all from above. A new form of transportation, yes, but also a way for people to make it on their own terms. You know, a, a mom who can just work while her kids are in school, or a dad who can turn off the app when it's time for family dinner. Yeah, that's a basic idea. It's people driving people, a car always with minutes, a private chauffeur, but only when you need it, so the cost is minimal. A real disruptor to the taxi space. I just need an operations type to run it, and there's no one better than you. <laughs> yeah, you might, you might have something. A lot of work to make that real, though. A lot of work. All right, so question for you. Is he lying? Is he lying about having the idea? Or is he living in his own reality distortion field? You know, that that term comes up with people like Steve Jobs. And I think, honestly, like the great, great entrepreneurs, they're a little imbalanced, frankly. Uh, they're not always rational. They are so focused on creating this vision and have such conviction around the vision of what they are building that they effectively convince themselves. I don't believe that they lie. I believe that they honestly believe what they say. And frankly, to a certain extent, they have to because the challenges of building an Uber or building any startup that's ultimately successful are so big as to be unsurmountable if you don't have that level of conviction to push you forward to accomplish impossible things, right? I mean. What he said here is like, oh, that's going to be a lot of work. He's not wrong. Think about how much money Uber had to raise in order to build the business that they're in. Like billions and billions of dollars had to be raised in order to make Uber what it is today and to, have, to make the whole thing work. I mean, to be able to do that, there are very few people in the world that can raise billions of dollars, let alone raise billions of dollars for something that doesn't work, that's getting sued all the time, that's breaking, where people are getting killed in the cabs, like just craziness, right? You need somebody that can make that happen. And that's just a rare, rare individual. Contributed a lot too. Absolutely. Well, it's good of you to make sure that he shares in the credit. Of course. Yeah, no, you got to, right? But at that point, it was just a matter of getting the angel investors on board. And, you know, when they saw how sticky this product what is. What do you say we get into the real questions? Sir? Are you willing to work with the outside money? Listen to wise counsel? I will always listen. And I'll take good ideas. But I'll never take orders. I can't. So that is such a good question. If you're an entrepreneur and you're trying to decide if you should take venture money, you got to ask yourself, are you willing to work with the outside money? Are you willing to listen to them? Are you willing to have some oversight in the business? Because if you're not, then you shouldn't raise venture money because basically like getting married to somebody, you're going to sit on that board with them for years, potentially decades, right? Maybe not decades with an S, but a decade is not uncommon in venture world. And you're going to give up control. That's just how these things work. People are not going to give you money without some level of assurance, protection, and control involved. The flip side is that I also like Joseph's response in this, right? Playing Travis's response in that he's like, I will take advice and I will implement good advice, but I'm not just going to you know, do whatever you say either. And I think as a VC, that, that is a great balance. 
you want somebody that will listen uh, and that will take good advice, but you also are hiring them to run the company. If you as a VC have to come in and run the company, then you have failed as a VC, in my opinion. You want to find those great leaders, those great innovators, and you want to back them. You want to give them the resources and the support they need to achieve the potential that they have. Otherwise, as a VC, you can't run all of your businesses, and most VCs, frankly, wouldn't be very good at running most of these businesses. It's all about finding the next great entrepreneur that can build this, build the company into something great. Good. I don't give orders. Good. What else do you need to know? How sticky is it? Really? If someone rides twice, we have them for life. I'm gonna end the clip there, but uh, that last piece is actually, there's a lot more baked in there than, than you might guess. So one, yeah, okay, you ride twice, we got you for life. Anyone that's ridden in an Uber or Lyft like knows how seamless that experience was, especially if like you were riding in taxis before and had to go through like that whole business. It's great. And, and honestly, like one of my mistakes, when I first saw Uber launch, I was like, eh, why is everyone so excited about this? I don't get it. Like they're competing in this relatively small, highly regulated, fragmented industry. Like I, I don't get, I don't get the, the vision. But the real vision is not taxis. The real vision is like all transportation and like how seamless and such a good experience it creates, creates that stickiness. But here's the piece that probably most people don't notice. And that is in the video, they didn't talk at all about how much traction they had. They talked about how sticky the product was. And one of the things that Bill Gurley understood, I think better than most other venture investors at the time was that you didn't need a lot of traction necessarily. You needed enough. You needed enough so that you had statistically significant data. But he was able to make a decision to invest in Uber in the very early days before they had very much revenue, largely because of that, that data around the user interaction and how sticky it was. And based on that, he was able to make an investment in the company at a very high valuation and right a very large check in the company that ultimately ended up being worth billions and billions of dollars and was a huge home run for the, for the firm. Benchmark has built a reputation on identifying these secrets before anybody else. And today that's kind of common knowledge, but back then the ability to make an investment based on very little information, but crucial information was a huge edge that, that Bill Gurley and Benchmark were able to deploy to get into some of the very best deals of that era. Anyways, I hope you enjoyed this uh, reacts. Let me know if I should do more of these on Super Pumped or any of the other uh, startup related shows that are out there. Throw me a line down in the comments. Let me know what you think. And uh, check out my other video where I do a Shark Tank react on breathometer. Thanks.